everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and this is part two of Darwin's Voyage of Discovery. So I hope you had a chance to watch the first part of this uh, hopefully interesting <laughs> lesson on uh, Charles Darwin and his ideas of natural selection. I, meant, I mentioned in the previous video that <clears throat> Charles Darwin uh, learned about some of the, his ideas on his voyage uh, around the world, and in particular the Galapagos Islands. But what's interesting is, when he came back to Great Britain, this is where he started putting all the pieces together. So it was sort of like a mosaic. It didn't just, just appear to him. When he was on the Galapagos Islands, walking around, it just didn't, the thought didn't enter his head. But, but rather, he acquired this notion of natural selection, his theory of how populations evolve, through a lot of other influences, and I and I, I think that that's really cool. And so, let's go through the principles of natural selection. So, one of the first things that is most important about natural selection is that all populations have a propensity to overproduce. This is a picture right here, kind of cool, of frog eggs. So, female frogs lay literally thousands and thousands of eggs, and the truth is. Only a small fraction of those eggs actually develop and move on to tadpoles and then to frogs. And, you know, well, why is that? Well, nature has a, has a capacity to overproduce. And so that's the first thing. You know, like, okay, overproduction. What does this have to do with anything? Well, Charles Darwin back in Great Britain had an opportunity to read a very famous book written by this gentleman over here, Thomas Maltus. Thomas Maltus, in the 1798, he wrote an essay about human populations, and it, and it was all about over-reproduction. And so this, this essay was, was quite controversial at the time because he sort of proposed that in the future, humans would be running out of food, that the human population was going to grow beyond the ability for humans to be able to generate enough food. And so there was going to be a lot of suffering and competition in the future. There was going to be disease and famine and homelessness. And it's like, well, where did he come up with this? Well, difficult for me to say, but during, uh, during the 1800s uh, in England, you were already starting to see a little bit of this. Like there was a lot of homelessness in the streets of England and there was a competition. And so I think what's somewhat controversial is that he would say that, you know, one of the, one of the things that might be inevitable in, in human society is that war was sort of inescapable. It was something that can reduce the population size so it doesn't become over overpopulated. But the truth is, you know, maybe someday Maltus will be right. But fortunately for us, we have kept up with it. We have, we have, our agriculture is sort of providing so far for the great numbers of humans on the earth. But Darwin was influenced by this whole idea of competition for survival mm -hmm. over reproduction and he sort of noted you know come to think of it it's not just humans all living populations tend to overproduce and I wonder if there's a struggle yeah so there's a great potential for fertility mm -hmm. so organisms really produce and I'm talking about anything it could be sea urchins it could be apple trees and oranges like for example a single apple tree you can look at all the apples and all the seeds, and if all those were to grow, the whole earth would be overwhelmed by apple trees, but we don't see that. Or even bacteria that have such a short generation time that divide. There could be millions that can overrun the earth, but we don't see it. But there's a great potential for fertility. But the environmental resources are limited. And so there's going to be a struggle for those limited resources. So not everyone's going to live. And so I don't know if you remember this from a previous discussion. I'll, I'll refresh you. This is the number of survivors versus age. This is a classic survivorship curve. Like if I were to ask you what is what survivorship curve would best one, two, or three represent humans? And the answer to that would, would be one. In other words, most human babies survive and generally humans survive until an old age and then they get very old and then they perish. But there's some populations, and I just want to emphasize type 3, that a lot of offspring are produced, but a lot of them perish very early in, in their lives. 
and there's a struggle for, com for resources, and there's predators and things like this, but there's a big struggle. They drop off, and then the survivors make it okay. So who determines who lives and who dies? This is a question. So there's a struggle for existence. This is part of natural selection. So there's overpopulation and competition, struggle amongst individuals. Now the truth is, individuals are different. And so the population, this is the next part of natural selection. In populations, I don't, I'm not talking about individuals, but in a big group, there's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of variation. Now, we know that. We know how var variation comes into play. We know that mutations cause different proteins, uh, ultimately, and therefore different traits. And we know that sexual reproduction and meiosis create variation in offspring. So populations are very diverse. Charles Darwin didn't know much about heredity, he didn't know much about genetics, he didn't know anything about molecular genetics for sure, but he did know through his observations that there's a lot of variation in a population. There are slightly different organisms, slightly different pigeons, slightly different horses, slightly different dogs, and so individuals of a population vary. And so there's no two individuals that are exactly alike. So what's the point of this? So if there's a struggle to survive, in other words, a struggle for food or a struggle against a predator that was coming, some individuals might have a greater advantage because their trait might give them some, some sort of advantage. Now, we know that variation is inheritable. So for example, if the dark color of this ladybug was was a good trait, like a good phenotype. So there's variation, and some phenotypes are considered to be good, and some are not good. What does this mean? That seems somewhat subjective. It means that in the local environment, whether it be the behavior or the coloration, it has some sort of trait that allows it to be out-competitive to the others. Look at the variation in snails. Look at this. It's crazy. So they're competing, they're competing. It sort of reminds me of like, these are different schools and they're competing over one trophy. There's only going to be one team that wins the trophy. So there's a struggle to survive and there's variation. Not all schools have the same talent. So there's going to be a winner and losers. And so when you look at that a population and you look at, for example, you could look at our school and you say the number of students in the school. This represents our whole student body and, and the trait. What trait do you want to consider? Height. So this means there's a very few individuals that are very short. More people are about this high, more people, but most people are kind of medium. So it starts off this way. So there's variation in the population. And so what I'm getting at is that sometimes a phenotype will lead to an, an adaptive advantage, meaning that it's able to do better in a particular situation. Same thing goes for any characteristic, like here are some birds, here we're considering it looks like beaks. And so here's like a really thin one. Here's a big chubby one. If I said, you know, which, which is the better beak? Which, what phenotype? See the diversity in the population? This doesn't represent one. This represents like 50, 50, 50, 50. So there's many birds. You're like, all right. So here's, here's the variation. What do you want? Well, which is better? What's the best phenotype? You're like, I don't know. Well, it depends. It depends on the environment. Like, for example, if there, if this environment, there are big seeds, for example. And, like, if there are big seeds, you're like, well, why only big seeds? We can say that maybe there's been a drought for a couple of years, and then all the grass is dying away, which makes little tiny seeds. And so the story goes, like, if there's a drought, there's only big seeds because the sort of the perennial trees create these big nuts. And so... If there's no more little seeds, these birds are all like, oh, no, no. And so they try very hard to get the seed, get the seed, and they can't get it. So no food, they die. And I'm not just talking about one, but many of them die, many of them die, many of them die. And so these guys up here, I'm talking about a population, maybe both of these. Maybe these guys survive. These guys don't. So these guys die. These guys live because they have a good phenotype. And so if they live and they get lots of food, then they're going to reproduce. And as it turns out, out of all of our study of heredity, big beak and big beak make big beaks for the most part. 
And so as it turns out, there might be some short ones in there, but some big beaks. And so in the next generation, there's going to be a lot of big beaks. And then not so many of these guys because they didn't live and have any children. And then the next generation, these guys, the children are reproducing, children are, are reproducing. And so what I'm talking about is in about five or ten years, all of a sudden the population went from sort of 25, 25, 25 to 75% big beaks. That's a change. And so what caused that change? Nature caused that change. And so as it turns out, Charles Darwin may have been one of the very first naturalists to visit the Galapagos Islands, and he, he did look at a few interesting things. But there's a couple, a married couple, Peter and Rosemary Grant, that did a really long-term study for literally a couple of decades on the Galapagos Islands looking at the, like what we were just talking about, beak depth. And what they came to the conclusion in, in their famous book called The Beak of the Finch, I recommend reading that, it's a pretty good read. What they've determined is that in wet years, when seeds are really abundant, there's individuals consume very little large seeds, like why would you? because they're kind of tough to crack. But during dry seasons, like when there's a drought, when seeds are scarce, the small seeds are quickly de depleted because those are easy to get. And as it turns out, food is scarce. And if food is scarce, there's going to be competition. So the birds, like do you remember the last picture, the birds with the larger, stronger beaks that can crack those have an advantage. So they're the ones getting the food. They're the ones reproducing. And so when you capture birds, over the years and you put up nets and you pull them in and you measure their the depth of their beak what happens is they notice there's like an increase in the number of big beaks during dry years and then during re rainy years not so much and then dry years it peaks rainy rainier years now dry it peaks and so what you're seeing is some phenotypes have an, have an advantage over other phenotypes when the environment changes. And so this struggle for existence isn't random. There's variation in the organisms. This is a praying mantis. Can you believe this? You know, it's, it's not all about beaks. Like, do you see here on the leaf? Like, if you're a praying mantis, like, maybe the characteristic that's best for you in this environment is that you look green so that you blend in and you look how flat your your abdomen is in your in your uh, thorax. Look at this. Incredible. It's an incredible trait to have. You're like, well, what happened to all the praying mantises that don't look like that? They've been eaten. So a praying mantis doesn't have to look like that. In a different background, it can have a completely different color. So there's variation. So variations in the organisms that are best adapted to the local environment leave more offspring. So then these favorable characteristics accumulate over generation and generation. What we say when an organism leaves more offspring, so these survivors have many more children, we call that fitness. In biology, fitness doesn't mean like how if you're strong or if you're fast or in good shape. Fitness means in biology that you have the most offspring. So a person on the street if you pulled up and you said, hey, do you remember studying natural selection somewhere in your education? They would be like, oh, yeah, that's Charles Darwin's uh, theory, survival of the fittest. But I, I want you to rethink that for a little bit. I, want, I don't want you um, who have been studying this to, to say that. I want you to, to rephrase it in this way. So pay close attention to this. I want you to think of natural selection as not survival of the fittest. I want you to think of it as the survivors are most fit, meaning the survivors of a struggle for, for existence leave the most offspring, which is what we really mean by fitness. So in other words, like look at this. This is also a praying mantis. Look how it's completely camouflaged with these orchids in the background here. Isn't that incredible? And so this, because it survives, it's going to have more children, and therefore it's going to be more fit, because fitness means reproductive output. So again, like you could be a female and be totally out of shape, like you've never run a mile in your whole life, you're sitting on the couch like eating Doritos, and you're like, ah, and you have 10 children, you're most fit.
because your genes are going on to the next generation. So the survivors are most fit. So as it turns out, there's an increased frequency in the next generation. That's what we're saying in terms of change. Because come on, if you're a praying mantis and you don't look like this, you're like, well, is the praying mantis evolving? The praying mantis does not evolve. The praying mantis lives, it eats. What do you want? What happens is it's a population. So if these individuals are camouflaged, these are the ones that are mating and having children. So there's an increased frequency in the next generation of favorable traits. And that's what we mean by evolution. Populations evolve. Individuals do not change. Individuals don't change. It's populations that evolved. That's the come away message here. So isn't that incredible? That's an incredible adaptation. So because it survives, it has more opportunity to mate with others, and therefore the survivors are most fit. There's all kinds of examples of this. Charles Darwin collected this frog that looks a little bit like a leaf here. It's actually the species is a tribute to Charles Darwin here. It's found in Chile, South America. So biological evolution refers to the changing of traits in, in organisms over multiple generations. It's like the bird doesn't change. You know, if you're familiar with these, these cartoons of, of like a monkey or a lizard turning into a monkey and then the monkey turns into a person and he starts walking, no, no, that, that, that's kind of a cartoon. Individuals don't change. The fact that they reproduce and generations change, uh, that's more likely the case. And so populations evolve. So natural selection is an interaction between individuals. They're competing, but really it's populations that are, that are changing. And so another example of that, just to drive home the point, because it's very important. So say you had some snail species right here. Do you notice how they're somewhat different shaped? There's variation. They overproduce. So they're just hanging out, everything's fine. And then, uh oh, predator comes. Big crab, big angry green crab is coming in, ah, destroying and eating and eating and eating. And as it turns out, these individuals over here seem to be the survivors. And so this phenotype is somehow more successful. Perhaps the snail shell is harder. And as a result of that, these ones reproduce and then their children also have the same appearance. And so if you were to look at the number of, of blunt shells versus narrow shells at the beginning, and then look at it after several generations of predation, there's more blunt shells. So therefore, there's been a change. It's, it's not disputable. There is a change. There's more blunt shells in the future generations than there were initially. This is natural selection. A change in population over time. Now one could say, well, what gives? You know, is, is that a good phenotype? Yeah, it seems to be a good phenotype because the crabs don't eat it. So you know what we call a good phenotype? An adaptation. This is a great trait that allows that organism to survive. Now it, it I'm looking at shapes of beaks and colors and things like this, but it could be behavior. It could be behavior, what the organisms do and how they hide or how they interact or how they're social. Some of the great, greatest adaptations that humans have are behavioral ones and how we work well together. Well, one of the classic examples of natural selection is this. You know, um, farmers were baffled by this. Do you know, like, here's a great example of natural selection in action. It's um, insecticide resistance. Do you know like farmers lose potentially millions of dollars when their crops are invaded by uh, annoying bugs? So these insects are in there like eating their crops and it's like, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to call up the poison guy and the poison guy is going to fly over and crop dust, in other words, spray pesticides onto our fields. And you know what that's going to do? Like here's a pest eating the leaves. It's going to go and it's going to like kill almost every one because it's a poison. It's going to kill almost every one of the pests that are bugging the, pun intended, bugging the crops. But it's like 99. Well, how come it doesn't kill like 100%? Well, because in a population of thousands and thousands of bugs, 
there's probably about 1%. Now, there's a lot of variation. There's probably about 1%. Here are all the bugs. Here's the crop ducts. This is like the poison cloud. There's probably, I know this, this looks like just one right here, but this represents maybe 1%. There's millions. 1% of them are just naturally resistant. They don't die. They have variation. Now, why do they have variation? Because their DNA is slightly different, as you can see by this cartoon. It's a different allele. And so as it turns out, the crop duster you know, flies by and goes, look, I killed all the bugs. And the farmer's like, awesome, I give you all this money. So next year he sprays again, and next year he sprays again. And then about four years from now, ready for this? <laughs> These guys are still in there reproducing, reproducing, reproducing. Because this right here is a survival survivor, and the survivors are most fit, meaning they have lots of offspring. And then how do you like this? Four years from now, there's a lot more bugs in there. And so then the guy comes by and sprays, and it doesn't kill any of them. Ah, the population is adapted through natural selection. So natural selection doesn't create. Did, does natural selection create variation? No. What creates variation? Mutation creates variation when you change the nitrogen based sequence of DNA and you create new alleles. So mutation, now Darwin didn't know that. He didn't understand mutation. So natural selection doesn't create variation, but it edits it. In other words, it says this is a good trait, this is not a good trait, depending on what the outward pressure is. So we just discovered that recently in the 20th century. If you remember during the 19, early part of the 1900s, we just started to figure out what mutations were or how heredity works. And that we know that DNA is the genetic material, and if you change the nitrogen base sequence, that's how you get variation. So variation is a changed nitrogen base sequence of a gene, which manifests into a different amino acid sequence in the polypeptide, which is, means a different trait. And so since there's many variations in a population, we must all have slightly different nitrogen base sequences, and we do. So which ones are best? One never knows. It depends on the environment. How do these mutations come into being? They could be spontaneous. They could be replication errors. DNA polymerase isn't perfect. And you know something? It's better that it's not because that's what creates variation. And variation will allow organisms to survive. So the very fact that we don't do things perfectly makes for change. How do you like that? Since if you follow the same recipe every time you get the same outcome, you'd never improve. So mutations change DNA. They result in new alleles, which manifest into all these different beaks. And as it turns out, depends if it rains or if it's dry or what the seeds are or if it's eating cactus or if it's eating worms, some variations are going to be better than others. Those are going to survive. Those are the ones that are going to have the most offspring. That's what we mean by fitness. And so Charles Darwin, wow, in the 1800s was thinking, this is his personal journal. He's like, I think, he wasn't sure that all species are descended from a common ancestor and the change was natural selection. It's absolutely brilliant. He thought of all of living things on the earth like a tree branching from a common trunk. It's magnificent. And so closely related species are ones that should sort of share a common descent and they diverged most recently in that tree. And so this is a picture of Charles Darwin. And so you know, sometimes people get really offended by the idea that natural selection is the cause of evolution and that uh, he basically wanted to show that supernatural creation really, there's no evidence of a supernatural creator that just put everything onto the earth at the same time. He thought that there were actual reasons, there was a physical reason for all of these things. And so he didn't mean to to really um, ran on anyone's parade, but in his famous book on the origin of species, he said when it, that endless forms of life, most beautiful, and, and he wanted people to believe that there's grandeur in this view of life, not just the Bible. And so I hope you enjoyed this video on natural selection. Thanks for watching.